So as I jumped into the text for study this week, I realized that we're hitting our third healing in a row. And if you read Mark, uh, you realize that Jesus is just getting started. There's going to be a lot more healings to come. And I realize that if left to my own devices, uh, I would just sit up here and um, bash uh, heretical modern faith healers every Sunday if I didn't do something to stop myself. Uh, so here we are. We're going to take a different look at the healing that we see and hear this morning and go through 17 verses. And we're going to look at it from a different perspective. As I looked at this text, I realized, uh, well, I guess Isaiah 5.20 was put on my mind. Isaiah 5.20 is, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who turn darkness into light and light into darkness, who turn bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter. That text just came to my mind, and I realized that what we're seeing in this text is some religious leaders, some Pharisees, and Jesus does a good thing. Not only is he going to heal a paralytic that has to come down through the roof to get to him, He's going to go up to a tax collector and convince that guy to leave his life of sin and follow him. Jesus does two really good things. And what is the response of the Pharisees? What is the response of the religi religious leaders? That's bad. You're terrible. What's wrong with you? This is awful. They call good evil and evil good. And a lot of times, I guess, I grew up hearing this verse quoted all the time. And I know for many of you, if I said, oh, they call evil good and good evil. There might be a section of the country that comes to your mind, or maybe a certain political leader, or maybe a certain subgroup of culture that comes to your mind and you think, oh, those people call good evil, evil good all the time. And that's what comes to my mind, but I realized that the very first time we get to watch this happen in the book of Mark, the people calling evil good and good evil are the religious leaders who are watching Jesus work in person. It's pretty striking to me and pretty terrifying. And I, I decided what I wanted to do is look at the lies that has to be in these Pharisees' hearts as Jesus addresses the lies in their hearts with truth. I wanted to look at the lies that is in their hearts that caused them to have such a horrible response, that caused them to be on the wrong side of history. And I realized, and I knew before I even got into it, that most of these lies would be very relatable. They would be lies that apply to you and me. Lies that the devil would also whisper into our hearts that we would be susceptible to. And so as a church, as we look at the danger of deception, as, as we kind of point out to what these Pharisees have done, I want you to realize as we go through that this is what we do too. This is the condition of our hearts as well. The stuff the Pharisees were made out of, it goes to dust when they die. The stuff that we're made out of, it goes to dust when we die. It all, it all is the same thing. It's the same people, the same heart condition. But we're going to look at five different lies of the Pharisees this morning. So lie number one, it is, it is probably the least relatable of all of them, especially amongst this crowd, but we're going to be faithful to the text and go into it anyway. The lie number one is that Jesus isn't God. Jesus isn't God. So in verse 6 and 7, that some of the scribes were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They believe that Jesus isn't God. That's the first lie in their heart, causing them to respond poorly to God doing a good work. And first of all, I'm just going to just take their argument out with a, with a kind of a sweep of the leg move here. I'm not going to fully deal with the deity of Christ. That's a doctrinal truth that could take us a long time to dig into. And I wanted to get into some other ones, because I know all of you probably already agree with me that Jesus is God. But we're going to sweep this out the legs with John 10.30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. There it is. Nice and clear. Jesus is God. Jesus is claiming oneness with God. God affirms Jesus' oneness with him at his baptism and many other times throughout his ministry, but Jesus and God are one. Jesus is God. We believe in the Trinitarian nature of God. Three persons, one God, all distinct from each other, using different roles to accomplish the same singular will of redemption on our earth. Trinitarian God. But I'd also like to say, okay, the, the, the Pharisees, it's not fair to say, well, they're just idiots because they didn't have our New Testament, right? They didn't have John 10.30. They couldn't scroll over in their Bibles to see I am the Father for one and decide that Jesus is God. However, they are no, no less responsible for doing this wrongly because the Pharisees, the Pharisees have one job. Okay? Here's the Pharisees' one job. Know the Old Testament like the back of your hand. That's their job. Now, I mean, that, that's, there's a teacher to the people. There's a live this. It's consistently in their synagogues. And what they're missing here is Jesus is fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy right before their eyes, and they missed it. It's like a guy that you pay to come, pay your street, do a new road, and then they quit halfway down the <laughs> You had one job. 
up. You missed it. And it's obvious to everyone that the person missed their one jump by what's left of the street in front of the church. I'm sorry. I'll stop. But let me give you a couple of the prophecies that are happening here that the, that the Pharisees should have picked up on real quickly. Let me read to you Isaiah 53, 11. He will see it out of his anguish, that's suffering, and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant, that's Jesus, will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. He will justify many and carry their iniquities. You know what Jesus said to the paralytic? Son, your sins are forgiven. That's bearing the iniquity of others and um, justifying many. That's what he's doing. By saying your sins are forgiven, he is not just saying you're healed. He is specifically fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy. And then let me read Psalm 103, verses 2 and 4 to you. We read this for communion. My soul prays the Lord and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your sin. See, red alert, red alert, forgiving sin. He heals all your diseases. Oh, there we go. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. To a Pharisee that knows the Old Testament law, when Jesus looks at the paralytic and says, Son, your sins are forgiven, that's one thing. But when he says that, and a guy who's been paralyzed all his life, and everyone in town recognizes this guy, that from birth he hasn't been able to walk. When that guy stands up, we've just fulfilled the prophecy. Jesus has just made it clear beyond a doubt, not only am I going to use a language that you should understand, but the proof is in the pudding. It's right here. It's right here. So the first lie that the Pharisees believed that they should have understood was that Jesus is not God. That's the first lie we saw from the Pharisees. Now, unless you're clapping yourself on the back and thinking that you're asleep, we've got four more, and they're much more relatable to us, lies that we also tell ourselves. Verse 7, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here's their lie. Are you ready? We get to decide how God works. We get to decide how God works. Why does he talk like this? What is he doing? Well, a, a cursory reading of Isaiah will remind you of one of our favorite verses, one of my favorite ones to quote all the time, 55. God's ways are higher than ours. His paths are higher than ours. His ways are better than ours. God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And, and, and just like we need to tell the Pharisees, we need to tell ourselves that God is not subject to our experience. God is not subject to our experience. There might have been some things that have happened in your life, but God is not subject to those things. You cannot use those things to now interpret and enforce a box upon God. God is also not subject to our denominations. I'm sort of speaking to the choir a little bit here, as we're a non-denominational church as part of an association. But something people get really trapped up in is, my church has always done it a certain way. This is how our denomination does it. The people that agree with me do it this way. God is not subject to our denominations. Denominations have their place, okay? They do. Associations and fellowships of like-minded believers who have similar convictions, they have their place. But we have to remember that God is not subject to our denomination. Just because we have developed a piece of paper, a statement of beliefs, uh, maybe a type of liturgy, does not mean that God is forced to work in that manner and in that way. God is not subject to our understanding. Just because God has never worked this way in your life before does not mean he's not allowed to work that way in your life now. Just because you don't understand what God is doing in your life does not mean that God has to make himself understood to you. God is not subject to our experience. He is not subject to our denominations. He is not subject to our understanding. And then here's the one that really kicks us. God is not subject to my preferences. God is not subject to my preferences. Now, how many of you who are married have had to give up one of your preferences and come to a compromise? And just said, you know what? This is the way I prefer it done, but I'm going to compromise. Dangerous question. Oh, it is. It is. I've had to give up a few of mine, so I'm not being a hypocrite here. In church, we tend to take our preferences and then elevate them up to the level of conviction and then enforce them. You see this in church all the time. Somebody's preference, who's a squeaky wheel, gets elevated to conviction and then becomes enforced. God is not subject to our preferences. And I'm being particularly vague in my application 
because I want you to search your own heart, find your own situation, and let the Lord speak into that as he would. But I just want to say God is not subject to these things. If God decides to work in your life, then you don't prefer the way he's working. And it's not the way that you see him historically working in your denomination and similar believers. And you don't understand what God's doing, and it doesn't match any of your experience, you still have to obey God. Yeah. It's still God. He's still sovereign. It's not his problem that you don't get it. It's our problem. So what we do is we stay in God's word. We keep following God. We keep seeking his face. And when he works and when he does things and when he confirms things and when he shows us how his word applies to our life, you know what we do? We change. We're the clay. Clay is not supposed to get brittle else the potter can't do anything with it. we got to stay pliable so God can keep working with us. We are to align with the word of God. God was doing a new and a wonderful thing, and the Pharisees missed it. You know why the Pharisees missed it? Because they wanted to stay comfy and safe with what they knew. They'd always done it this way. This is how the synagogue had worked. This is how it had been done. And they were missing a beautiful, wonderful, redemptive thing that God was doing in their life because they wanted to stay safe and they wanted to stay comfortable with what they'd always known. And I've been working on this message all week, and it's just no coincidence that God kicked us out of our church building this morning. Maybe God wants to do some stuff with us. Maybe he wants to move us out of what we're safe and comfortable with. Maybe he wants to do a new and a wonderful thing with our church, and we have to be willing to follow him where he goes. I don't have a specific agenda in mind. I just want our hearts to be in a condition where when God says, I'm going to work in a way that's not safe and not comfortable and not preferential and not experienced and not understood, that he'll still follow me anyway. And I want us to see that because we watch the Pharisees land on the wrong side of history. They're never a good sermon illustration. I'm just going to tell you right now. They're, they're almost always the bad guy. And they missed God healing a man. They, they completely glossed over the fact that a man could now walk and earn a living and be productive in society because we've never heard this done before. Completely missed it. And we are susceptible to the same lot. We are susceptible to miss the working of God because it's different than what we have. All right, I'll stop hammering that one and move on to lie number three. Jesus needs to come to us, not the other way around. We're the authority. We're the leaders. Jesus needs to come to us, not the other way around. Now, first of all, before I even get into what is wrong with that lie, I want to point out that if you'll go back to what I preached on last week, and the man was cleansed from leprosy, Jesus had tried to go to them. He actually had. He had told the guy, go back to your local church, go through the cleansing rites, and go get it figured out at the temple. And you know what the guy did? He didn't do it. Can you believe that? Christian not going to the local church. We've never heard of that before. But no, the guy doesn't do what he's supposed to do. Jesus had actually tried to go to the Pharisees, okay? So Jesus is guiltless here, but they expected Jesus to come to them to get their permission, to get their approval, and to do it the way they wanted to. Whenever we have the attitude of so-and-so or somebody needs to come to us, that is just straight-up pride. That's what we're seeing right here. I stand alone here in my rightness and how great I am and expect everyone to come to me. That is a prideful heart. That is not a heart that follows God. In fact, what's awesome is this isn't even Jesus' example. We've got a God whose ways are higher than our ways. We've got a God who is the creator of the universe. We've got a God who gave them the whole law. And you know what we see Jesus doing? He's there with them. If anybody is allowed to say, you have to come to me, it's God. Because he's holy, and he's righteous, and he's better than us. And we've rebelled, and we've sinned, and we've got problems. And Jesus does, and God does say that to us. He says, you must come. Choose you this day who you will serve. You must come to me. You must be reconciled. Repent from your sin. But then at the very same time, Jesus comes into the world and says, you know what? I'm going to come to you anyway. I'm just going to come down and be with you. And I'm going to reconcile this problem. And I'm going to fix this relationship. And I'm going to pay the price for sin. Because there's something we know about sin that whenever someone sins, someone pays the price for it. If I sin against you, well, we've, we talk about this in, in counseling all the time. There, there's two different kinds of sins, right? There's sins you can pay for and sins you can't pay for. I take five bucks out of your pocket and I feel bad later. I come back to you and I say, hey, man, I'm sorry. I took five bucks out of your pocket and I hand you five bucks back. 
Awesome. Maybe I hand you another five bucks and I say, I feel really bad about it. I'm going to give you a 10 back. And I shake your hand, you forgive me, and you say, no worries, bud. You took the five bucks, but you made it right. We're all good. I feel pretty good about that. That's the sin I can pay for. What happens when I run over your dog? I can't just buy you a new dog. Okay? I can't fix this. This is not a sin I can pay for. This is the kind of sin where you're going to have to accept the hurt. You're going to have to accept the pain. If you are going to forgive me for running over your dog, you're going to have to say, there's nothing you can do to make it right. I'm just going to take it. My dog's gone, and I'm going to forgive you anyway. These are the sins that really mess up relationships. Because many times our hearts are not in a place where we're willing to pay the price for someone else's sin. And yet as Christians, we have the example of a Savior who comes down to earth and says, I'm going to pay the price for your sin. You can't pay me back five bucks to fix this one, guys. I'm going to come down and I'm going to heal your sick. And I'm going to tell you about the gospel. And then I'm going to head on. And later on in Psalm 103, that's what he's foreshadowing, where he stretches himself out on a cross and he's crucified for our sin. It is not the example of Jesus to say, you have to come to me. It is the example of Christ to say, I will come to you. I will make this right. I will pay for this if I need to, and I will fix it. And that is the example that Christians are to follow. We don't see that attitude here in the Pharisees. The Pharisees aren't going to Jesus and saying, hey, tell me about what's going on. Hey, Jesus, how can we figure this out? Jesus, there's a little tension here. Jesus, I think this relationship is heading somewhere bad. Can we get it figured out? Jesus doesn't do that. Well, the Pharisees don't do that, but Jesus does. He comes into this relationship and he tries to make it right. And he does that with all of us. The Christian should be aware of the deceptive, deceptive and destructive nature of the lie that you have to come to me, I don't need to come to you. It's not the attitude our God has with us, and it's not the attitude that we're to have with other people. Lie number four. Lie number four. Verse 16. We've seen that he just called Levi out of uh, tax collecting. And when you read tax collecting, think embezzlement, fraud, robbing people. Don't just think collecting taxes. Think this guy had ripped off everybody he was supposed to take care of. He was in league with the corrupt government. This ain't a great guy. He called this guy out of this life, and this man had decided to get up and follow Jesus. And now Jesus is at a house with these disciples, well, at this guy's house, with the other tax collectors and sinners and his disciples. And when the scribes see this, they say, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Lie number four. Holy people don't sit with those kinds of people. If you know me at all, I get really worked up about this one. Holy people don't sit with those kinds of people. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Jesus sits with those kinds of people. Jesus sits with tax collectors and sinners. So yes, holy people do sit with those kinds of people. I've always wondered, what would a church do if they found out their pastor had been hanging out in a gay bar? What's the question that church leadership would ask of the pastor? Because you know the question they should ask is, how many people did you share the gospel to in the gay bar? Is that what you think church leadership would ask their pastor to find that way? No. Why? Because we're susceptible to this lie. We think that too. We think that holy people don't hang out with those kinds of people. Well, they do. But they don't just hang out with them, obviously. If you look at what's happening here, he's just called the man out of the life of sin to follow him. What he does is he's hanging out with these people with discipleship in mind. He's hanging out with these people with discipleship in mind. Verse 14, he's just told someone, he saw Levi, and he said, follow me. So he got up, and he followed him. If someone regularly hangs out with people they shouldn't be hanging out with, the wrong crowd, and they're not having a goal of discipleship and gospel sharing, that's probably an issue, okay? But that's not usually our problem. It's okay for Christians to hang out with people who aren't Christians. You know what it's not okay to do? It's not okay for Christians to act like people who aren't Christians when they're with people that aren't Christians. We are to hang out with these people. We are to sit with these people. We are to be with these people. In fact, if you are walking and following Jesus, I hope you find yourself in uncomfortable situations with uncomfortable people because your desire to share the gospel is taking you to people that need the gospel. That's how it's supposed to work. 
You should find the sinning people that need the gospel, and because you want to share, you should be there. But then what I hope you don't do, and, and this is a mistake I made lots of times in EMS, so this is pot calling the kettle black. This is just me saying we all need to repent of this together and work on it. You don't get to take off the Christian peace. You know, the hardest thing for me to do was pray before my food when I was eating with my EMS partners at work. That's really weird to say, hey, hold on a minute, I'm going to pray for my food. I don't know why, just in here like, well, Joe, you're a confident, courageous dude. Yeah, not when I'm around a bunch of peer pressure and people that aren't Christians. There's words that came out of my mouth that shouldn't have come out of my mouth. Sometimes I, I let myself act like I wasn't a Christian when I was with people that weren't Christians, and that's wrong, and i got to repent from that. It is absolutely imperative that Christians will hang out with non-Christians. How will they hear without a preacher? How will they believe on him they have not heard? But it's not okay for us to not act like Christians when we're with those people. And that's the balance we have. We're not to judge people for who they hang out with and what they do. We're supposed to go be a light to the darkness. If you're going to go be a light in the darkness, you're going to have to wade in some darkness. But then you're still called to be holy as I am holy, is what God says. One question to be asked when you decide whether or not you need to hang out with someone. Here's the question. Do they need Jesus? That's the question to ask. You don't ask... Do they dress the way I want them to dress? Do they smell the way I want them to smell? Do they act the way I want them to act? Do they work the way I want them to work? You don't ask this question. You ask one question. Do they need Jesus? And sometimes you're going to find out but you're going to need to hang out with people that need Jesus. They're going to need you to tell them about Jesus. That's why God has us in this world, is to tell people about Jesus. And we have to be there with them. If Jesus isn't God, that's the first lie they believed. We decide how God works was the second lie they believed. He has to come to us, not the other way around. That's the third life they believed. And number four, holy people don't sit with those kinds of people. And we're ready for lie number five, the king of them all, the top lie, the one that we have to be the most careful of, the lie that trumped all of them. We are fine. There's nothing wrong with us. There it is. There's the big daddy lie. We are fine. There's nothing wrong with us. Verse 17. When Jesus heard this, he told them, Those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do need one. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is what is known theologically as Hebrew sarcasm. Jesus is messing with them a little bit here. They're like, what's going on? He's like, well, if you're well, you don't need me. I didn't come here for the righteous. I came here for the sinners. Jesus is simultaneously putting them in this weird conundrum where they either need to admit they're sick to get Jesus to talk to them or hold on to their righteousness, and then he says he's not there for them. He kind of backs them into a corner, and, and that's obviously how we discover what these lies are. I'm not walking you through the whole study process, but what I'm doing with these lies is I'm looking at what is Jesus' response to what they said because he's going to take his truth and apply it directly to the lie. That's where I'm figuring out what these lies are as I look at what they say and how Jesus responds to them. We're fine. There's nothing wrong with us. Self-righteousness is a special kind of deception that is born out of the pit of hell designed to ensure your destruction. Self-righteousness is not going to help you. And as these Pharisees are sitting there and Jesus is saying, I'm not here for the righteous, he said that because they thought they were righteous. He said that because they thought they were okay. And I mean, I want you to get this with me. They thought they could sit in judgment, condemning judgment of the Son of God. This is a pretty high level of self-righteousness here. But it doesn't take long for self-righteousness to start off here and take your place to where you stand in condemning judgment of the Son of God. Self-righteousness is a slippery slope. It is a dangerous place to find yourself. And I can tell you confidently that you are not okay. I can tell you that confidently. And if I look at you and I say, I want you to know that you are not okay. If that kind of assaults your senses, if that makes you a little bit mad, if that pricks you a little bit like it pricks me when people say it to me, that means I got some self-righteousness I got to work on. The only way you or I are ever okay for anything is the result of the radical work of Christ. And that there's the good news. I have some really good news for people in the room who aren't okay. Right? I'm not going to leave you there. Jesus says, I didn't come for the righteous. If you've got it all figured out, if you're all taken care of, if you're perfect, if you're righteous, then hit the road. I came here for sinners. 
I came here for people. I came here for people who are not okay. I came here for people who need help. And there we have it. The good news of the gospel that Christ died for sinners. Amen. That's only good news to you if you've gotten through the hard news that you're a sinner. It's only good news if you've figured out that you're a sinner and you're not okay. But if you have figured out that you're not okay, that your works are not enough, that your righteousness will never get you to a right standing with God, if you come to this low place where you take your self-esteem and you chuck it out the window and you say, I am wretched, I need help, I need a Savior, I'm on my way to help, and I can't do anything about it. If you've got yourself to that place, then there's great news. 1 Corinthians 15.3, Christ died for sinners, and on the third day he rose again. All we have to do is repent and believe. That's all there is to it. Admit that way, my way is evil. Turn from that. Walk away from that. And admit that God's way is good and run after that. That's all I have to do. And then I will be saved. And you know what happens to people when they believe the good news? Well, I got two examples in my passage. I'm going to describe it like this. You haven't walked all your life. You haven't been productive. You've been a problem. You've been half paralyzed and a beggar. And God comes around and says, your sins are forgiven. Rise and walk. That's what happens when the good news hits people. Or you're caught up in your sin and you're living a lifestyle of sin and you're chasing money and the things you want and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And Jesus comes in and he says, follow me. And you turn from that and you follow him. This is why I expect us to get excited when we sing. So I expect a few hallelujahs and amens when I'm preaching. Because if you're this, if this paralyzed guy in this room was here, and I said, hey, you know what? There's good news that Christ saves sinners. I don't think he'd stay in his chair after I said that. He'd say, hey, no, 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 no. Look at me. Look at me, guys. Let me tell you about it. Because I was sitting there. I was in the dust of the road. I didn't have anything to eat. And Jesus came along and he fixed me. Christians should be the most excited people you'll ever meet. Yeah. Save me from the pit of hell is what David says in Psalm 103. If you've been saved from the pit, boy, how you should have something good to say. Yep. The only thing that is okay about you or me, if there is any part of us that even is okay, and I didn't take the time to work through the commentaries to decide if any part of us could ever be partly okay or mostly okay or whatever. But if there's any part of you that is even partly okay, it's because of the radical working of Christ in you. You don't get to claim any of it. You get to say, yeah, I was sick and he healed me. I was a sinner and he made me a saint. I was paralyzed, he made me walk. I was walking in sin and he called me to follow him and I went the other way. Christ is good. Thank you, Jesus. The dangers of deception. We are to be wary of deception. These five lies will penetrate our hearts and get into our actions, our attitudes, and our behaviors just as fast as it got to the Pharisees. We're aware of the lies. We've looked at the lies. But how do we run from these lies? What is our balm? What is the thing that wards these lies off? And I'm going to read to you John chapter 8, verses 30 through 32 for you and close. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. These lies held these Pharisees in bondage. These lies made them watch miracles and healings and good things happen and to be grumpy about it somehow. They were upset about the work of God in their community because they were held captive. They weren't free to enjoy these things. They were held captive, but Jesus says, if you continue in my word, people will know you really are my disciples. And, and do I even have to say it? Read this book. Read it. you got to know what's in there. You say, well, I love Jesus, but I don't like to read my Bible. If you really are my disciples, you will continue in my word. Amen. We have to read this book. If we aren't reading this book, you know what happens? Those lies start taking over in our hearts. We start having less and less of a grip on the truth and the light in our darkness. The darkness starts to take over, and there's more captivity, and there's more lies, and there's more bondage, and we find ourselves... Continuing down this road of not even knowing who Jesus is. If you're not in this word, you're not truly Jesus' disciple. And, and if you're saying, well, Joe, I love Jesus, but I haven't been in his word, and I need to do it. Well, great, there's good news for you. Jesus didn't come for people who have it all together. So if you didn't complete McShane's read through the Bible in a year plan last year, it's okay. But repent, maybe. 
Maybe repent from where you're at. Maybe step up your Bible reading game a little bit. Maybe say, well, you know, I read the Bible a little bit last year. I'm going to read it a lot this year. Maybe you just got to come in and say, Lord, I'm not great at reading my Bible. And it's confusing, but I'm going to give you five minutes a day. I'm going to do something. You really are my disciples. You will follow my word. Deception is real. Deception is dangerous. And deception is destructive. And these same lies hit all of our hearts. There's good news that Christ died for sinners, that he came for people who aren't okay. He came to make the unrighteous righteous. He came to make the paralyzed walk. And he will do the same in your life and my life if we will repent of our sin. We will believe in him and we will follow his word.